So now I'd like to move on to the first session, um, which is session one, Foundations in Cell and Gene Therapy and Maternal and Child Health. And with that, I'll turn it over to our session moderators and education committee member, so, um, Melissa Mavers and Natalia Gomez Espino, and Melissa will be starting. Melissa? Thank you, Tony. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to session one of the symposium, where we will be focusing, continuing to focus on foundations in cell and gene therapy in maternal and child health. Uh, as Tony said, my name is Melissa Mavers, and I'm an instructor in the Division of Pediatric Hematology, Oncology, Stem Cell Transplantation, and Regenerative Medicine. My co-moderator and our first speaker is Dr. Natalia Gomez Ospina, Assistant Professor of Pediatrics in the Division of Medical Genetics. She will be presenting her work entitled Using the Blood to Treat the Brain, Engineering the Hematopoietic System to Treat Non-Hematological Diseases. Dr. Gomez Ospina. Thank you, Melissa. <laughs> so we just heard a great um, talk about a journey that went from um, understanding uh, gene regulation, uh, basic disease pathology to a targeted therapy using hematopoietic stem cells uh, to treat a hematological disease, a sickle cell disease. Um, so in this presentation, what I'm gonna be talking about is to the use of hematopoietic stem cells to treat non-hematological diseases. And so specifically, we're talking about neurodegenerative diseases that affect children. Now, neurodegeneration is a broad term that describes processes that affect either the white or the gray matter in the brain, but clinically they look uh, the same, progressive loss of neurologic function. And I'm always a bit ambivalent about showing this picture here, but this family has been generous enough to show their story online. And this is what it looks like, starts with a previously healthy child who starts to lose milestones and regress and ends up losing all neurologic function. Um, there are many there cause, different causes for neurodegeneration, but in children, genetic causes are very important. And studies that have looked at the causes of neurodegeneration in children have found that a large proportion are due to a group of genetic diseases known as lysosomal source disorders. Um, these organelles and proteins within these organelles have, are emerging as very as important players, not just in childhood neurodegeneration, but also in adult onset in that what happens if you had complete breakdown um, of lysosomal function because you have inherited two abnormal copies of the gene, um, you will have um, severe onset and uh, severe disease, which starts when you're a child. But if you inherit uh, one abnormal copy and sort of partial function, then you have, you're predisposed to having adult onset disease. And a, a very, uh, the most, uh, the best documented example of this is the gene GBA where bilinic loss causes Gaucher disease. But if you're a carrier, you have, it is the highest known risk factor for having uh, Parkinson's disease. So um, lysosomal stress disorders are a large group of genetic conditions that result from deficiencies in, in lysosomal proteins that live within this organelle. Um, these um, organelles are four enzymes that are in charge of degrading and recycling um, um, macromolecules. And because of this very important function, um, lysosomal dysfunction can affect uh, different cell types and manifests as problems in many organ systems. Um, cells in the brain, however, are exquisitely uh, sensitive to lysosomal dysfunction, and many of these diseases have uh, uh, neurological presentations. Now, due to a fortuitous mistake, researchers noticed uh, that cells that had normal expression of lysosomal enzymes could cross-correct cells that had a genetic defect. And so one of the reasons this happened is that lysosomal enzymes are modified with this mannose-6-phosphate residues and are constantly being secreted into the extracellular space. And um, any cell that has a mannose-6-phosphate receptor in the vicinity can uptake the enzyme and it gets localized into the lysosome. This is, um, so this is a mechanism that is known as cross-correction and is the basis for um, therapies for this type of diseases. Now there's, um, there is cross-correction also in, in genes that are not just lysosomal enzymes. Uh, and there are some membrane proteins that show cross-correction. And so we know that there are other mechanisms. And so secretion is, is not the only mechanism, but that's a very important one for lysosomal enzymes. So a corollary to this protein is to this, to this mechanism is that the goal of therapy is to create um, uh, reconstitute enzyme activity in specific enzyme depots in the body that could treat other affected tissues, even if you're not treating specifically targeting them. So you can treat another organ and, and, and as long as um, it can uh, generate cells that can get into the vicinity of neurons, for example, to secrete the enzyme. Uh, 
Um, many patients with LSDs don't have any effective treatments. A few of them do. And um, these therapies are based, um, the, the most important one or most common one is enzyme replacement therapy, abbreviated here as ERT. Um, ERT is uh, mostly delivered intravenously, um, but recently there's been, a, uh, there's an intrathecal version approved. And um, as you can imagine, this is the delivery of recombinant enzyme, uh, usually weekly. So it's an expensive treatment and involves, involves chronic administration. And if you do it intra intravenously, you won't target the brain. So it'll treat some of the systemic symptoms. Or if you do it intrathecally, you have a child who has a port in their head for the rest of their lives. Um, a few of these can be treated with allogeneic hematopoietic, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, where it has been shown to arrest uh, the neurological decline. This process, as you can imagine, uh, has certain morbidity and mortality, and for that reason, is really only reserved for patients who are mildly affected. Um, and so many patients do not to benefit from this approach. So why does hematopoietic stem cell transplantation work? Well, it, it, it generally is better than an ERT because one of the reasons is you have an endogenous enzyme depot um, that is persistent. And the other one and most important one is that the hematopoietic system can generate monocytes and macrophages, which can ma migrate into tissues like the brain, but also uh, liver and spleen and lung to deliver enzyme locally. This process, um, and it's part of this process um, and a, a very important part of this is the condition regimen and we'll back to we'll talk to this again. So based on what I've told you we and others have proposed that, that, that an autologous transplantation of modified cells would likely be better and the idea is to isolate cells and, and um, human hematopoietic stem cells I described before that have this marker CD34. We modify them outside of the body. Right now we're using genome editing uh, or CRISPR-Cas9 specifically. And these cells, we expect them that follow transplantation, they'll reconstitute the hematopoietic system and send out this uh, nifty uh, monocytes and macrophages to tissues. Uh, so instead of using uh, targeted individual mutations or even individual genes, we decided to target enzyme expression cassettes to a safe harbor locus. What is a safe harbor locus? Well, it's a gene that we think doesn't really have a, an important and necessary role for human development or, or health. And uh, we've used CCR5 as a safe harbor. Um, and for a couple of reasons, we know that um, uh, people who have uh, deletions in this gene are resistant to HIV infection and otherwise they're completely healthy and about 10% of the population, here's the UK biobank, are um, lack expression of this gene. So we are repurposing it to make um, therapeutic proteins. Um, a safe harbor has multiple advantages. Why do this? Well, it enhances potency because you can, if you're, you can, it allows for uh, supraphysiological expression, if you think. Remember, we're utilizing the hematopoietic system to deliver protein that it's, um, um, it's not necessarily its job to do that. And so we're uh, engineering it to do a better job. It also circumvents the designs of specific mutations in a gene. So you don't have to redesign your therapy for each patient. Unlike sickle cell disease, most other diseases, every patient has their own um, set of unique mutations. And so, um, and the other thing is you can engineer the coding sequences to enhance therapeutic pot potency. So for example, you can think of helping this protein cross the blood-brain barrier. And most importantly, it's a very versatile and easily adaptable platform for other LSDs. And so the first example that I'm gonna show you is to demonstrate the approach in mucopolysaccharidosis type one or MPS1, also known as Hurler syndrome. So this is uh, one of the most common lysosomal source diseases. It affects many organ systems, as you can see in the symptom list on the left. It, um, uh, in its severe form, it causes um, rapid neurodegeneration with death in the first or second decade without any intervention. But you can see that affects other organ systems. The enzyme is due to the lack of activity of this enzyme, iduronidase or IDUA. And um, like many enzymatic deficiencies, patients, um, there's sort of a range of effects depending on how much residual enzyme you have. So if you have almost zero, you have severe MPS1, but if you have 1%, you're attenuated and your effect on the CNS is much less. So this is important in terms of thinking about the therapeutic th threshold that we need to achieve to correct the disease. So it's not that we need to reconstitute 100% or 50% or 25% activity. If we are able to reconstitute a couple percent of the normal enzymatic activity, the patients will do much better. Um, 
you might think that this disease is, is very rare, and it is, but it is important enough that it's part of several new work screening programs in several states across the United States. So every blue state screens every child for this disease. Um, highlighting the importance of having an effective treatment, you know, when we, when we call families. Um, so um, here I'm showing you the uh, efficiency of modification. So um, these are the type of expression cassettes that we targeted to the CCFR locus for our preclinical studies. We've tested different promoters, um, uh, the SFV, which we've described before, and a strong constitutive promoter like PGK. And we can add a selectable marker or reporter gene so we can track these cells in vivo and isolate them. But for clinical purposes, we'd use more of a, a vector that looks like this without the fluorescent protein. Um, if they have a marker, you can see them using facts and you can uh, measure the target integration by the reported protein or by looking at the gene sequence itself. And uh, every one of these is an independent human donor. So when the stem cells are derived from whole blood, we get a average of 35% of the cells are modified. When the cells are from peripheral blood, about 25%. And when you make a smaller modification by removing the reporter, you have about 40% modification. And when you look at these cells and you differentiate the stem cells into monocytes macrophages, which we think are a big part of the effector cells, these cells secrete super physiological amounts of uh, adrenalase compared to unmodified cells. So uh, the SFV promoter is several hundred fold versus a PGK promoter is about 50 fold more enzyme. So, um, there's um, so starting with uh, edit, you know modifying human cells is great, but it does making testing their efficacy in vivo a little bit difficult. So what we needed to do was to um, remake our mouse models, um, and this is a mouse model of the disease that is also immunocompromised to allow for engraftment of the human cells. So these mice lack in adrenalinase uh, activity and. In the, as the absence of this enzyme, they accumulate this GAGs, uh, um, glycosan, aminoglycans in different tissues. So this is a way to measure biochemical correction and they have uh, phenotypic effects as, as, as the humans do. And so this is what happens with transplantation. You decrease the amount of secretion of the metabolite that accumulates, GAGs, you're comparing blue dots to the red dots. You decrease GAG accumulation in tissues, spleen, uh, liver, and, and with this approach, we didn't see it in the brain, and I'll come back to this. And there's enzyme reconstitution, uh, which is partial in the serum membrane and, and almost complete in, in the liver and spleen. And most importantly, we see uh, improvement in their uh, neuro behavior, locomotion, memory, and, and anxiety. And I mentioned before, the conditioning is a very important part of this process and that it, 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 it also creates room in the, in the bone marrow for engraftment, but also room in, the, in, in other tissues for migration. And so uh, when we repeat all of these experiments that switch to busulfan, which is actually the agent that is used in clinic, you can see a couple of things. One, that the percentage of cells that engraft that are edited, it's higher. Um, and therefore the biochemical correction is much higher. So you get much higher levels of enzymatic reconstitution and you finally see uh, significant decreases in, in, harder to, in the GAG accumulation and harder to treat organs. So I've described this to you as a, as a platform approach. And of course we're using it to other lysosomal enzymes. So Samantha um, used this to create a universal correction strategy for another common storage disease known as Gaucher. This is an incredibly complex disease, but is it's very interesting. And the most common form in the Western world is this type one with hepatosplenomegaly and bone disease. And it's about 95% of patients. But on the other side, you have patients that have early neurodegeneration uh, in infancy and don't live past a couple of years of age. The problem here is another enzyme, glucocerebrosidase, and the thing that accumulates in this disease is glucosyramide and glucosphingosine. And most of the symptoms of this disease, at least in type one, it's a problem with the monocytes and macrophages. And so as with NMPS1, I described to you a method where we're using a constitutive promoter to express the enzyme everywhere. And to make a long story short, um, if you express this other enzyme, glucocerebrosidase or GCAs, in the hematopoietic cells, you prevent engraftment. 
So what we do, what we did is use the very same system to restrict the enzyme expression to the cells that need it, the monocytes and macrophages. And we do this by switching the promoter. So here we use the CD6J promoter as a protein that is primarily expressed in this cell types. And you can see that the undifferentiated cells are not expressing the reporter anymore, and you need to push them through macrophage differentiation in order to start seeing protein expression. And these cells engraft beautifully, and they make very nice uh, human macrophages in vivo, especially if you use these mice that have are not only immunocompromised, but are transgenic for uh, human cytokines that help their differentiation. So you see that you only see green cells in cells that are myeloid or, 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 or monocytes. Um, you can see them in vivo. And here I'm showing you the extraction of macrophages from different tissues, lung, per, uh, peritoneum, and liver, where you can see a good fraction of human cells, human macrophages in there. So, but um, HSCT uh, is great, but it does have some limitations. And one is that it's slow and that it takes time for the cells to engraft, proliferate and migrate. And so what do we do with a disease that has very rapid neurological decline? And this is another example. The deficiency here is an enzyme called ga galactoserebrosidase and their severe and infantile onset is this picture, three or six months, uh, no survival past a couple of years without intervention, even though there are mild forms. And this, like MPS1, is another disease that is being part that is uh, screened in several states um, in the country. What we're trying to do here One is. Minute, Julia, thank you. Thank you. We're trying to combine hematopoietic stem cell transplantation with transplantation of cells that are also modified in the same way directly into the brain. And here I'm showing you data using neural. Uh, human neural stem cells that are edited in a very similar way. The CCR5 locus, we use a different marker to isolate them, CD19. These cells also secrete superphysiological enzyme, enzyme can cross correct cells and engraft and make uh, myelin producing cells. And we're testing the efficacy of these cells in this mouse model of Carbet disease um, that uh, known as Twitcher, uh, which you can see because it has uh, sort of a twitching phenotype. So hopefully uh, I've shown you that the hematopoietic system can deliver proteins uh, to other organs, specifically the brain. And this is applicable, not just to lysosomal enzymes, but also to secreted proteins that have their accretive potential. Genome editing allows for precise genetic correction and also the ability to synthesize new coding and regulatory sequences. And the Safe Harbor approach is a flexible platform for the expression of these proteins. And here I want to thank uh, MCHRI for uh, not just for finding, but all the support that the Institute has given me to conduct this research. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia, for such an excellent talk. Um, we do have a few uh, questions that have come in. Um, first, can you speculate about the contribution that busulfan makes to clearing the microglial niche in the brain versus the bone marrow niche? Um, the contribution. So, I mean, we know that compared to um, total body radiation, busulfan has a much better role in, um, we don't know exactly how it's conditioning um, these target organs. Um, um, there is probably some degree of microglia injury that's it's, um, um, producing signals that are um, eliciting the recruitment of, 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 of cells from the bone marrow. Um, and busulfan does this because it crosses the blood-brain barrier. Other agents that are used for conditioning that don't cross the blood-brain barrier don't have the same effect. So it's just as important as, as important to the cells as the conditioning regimen to get the cells to um, to migrate. Great. Uh, another question. <clears throat> Excuse me. Is there any reason uh, not to use a myeloid-specific promoter for MPS as well, since you are primarily targeting these cells as delivery vehicles for the enzyme? Uh, no, there is no reason. I mean, there are, as you can see, even from listening to the sickle cell disease conversation, there are multiple ways of doing these things. And um, our rationale was that um, if the cells could tolerate it, and we know that by, because they retain their ability to engraft, um, that we wanted to maximize uh, protein expression from other lineages as well. And so um, it's gonna be disease specific, right? And it could work as well, I imagine. Right. Um, one more question. Can you speculate about cross-correction approaches for common neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Huntington's, et cetera? Yeah. So it's, uh, you know, these are um, polygenic, per, probably multifactorial diseases. And so I can comment 
more, more on sort of Parkinson's disease and this sort of group of patients that we know have inherited deficiencies in GBA. So in those situations, we know that there is, we know that the, the protein that could be helpful in, um, in um, improving lysosomal function in these cells. But, you know, you can envision therapies like this, not just to secrete, um, um, they could secrete, you know, survival signals, uh, growth factors to maintain the viability of this neuron. So it doesn't have to be so much based on the, the knowledge of the underlying genetics. So yeah, you can use this to secrete um, different kinds of things that you could think would be helpful. Great, well, thanks again. That was a fantastic talk. Um, I think we'll go ahead and move on. Uh, next, we have a presentation on uh, ex vivo expansion of functional hematopoietic stem cells towards new paradigms for cell and gene therapy. Unfortunately, Dr. Hiro Nakauchi had to be away for a family emergency. So this work will be presented by Dr. Adam Wilkinson, an instructor in Dr. Nakauchi's lab in the Institute for Stem Cell Biology and Regenerative Medicine, who has uh, conducted the majority of this work. Dr. Wilkinson. So yeah, thank you very much for this opportunity to present on uh, Hironakuchi's uh, behalf. Uh, so we are interested in hematopoietic stem cells, or HSCs, because they support lifelong uh, hematopoietic homeostasis, and they can also rebuild the entire hematopoietic system following transplantation through a combination of self-renewal and antipotency. This, of course, is the basis for HSCT, um, a curative therapy for a range of blood diseases. And this has led to uh, a number of efforts to grow HSCs or expand them ex vivo. However, HSCs remain notoriously difficult to grow outside the body, despite various um, factors being identified um, over the years. We made a bit of a breakthrough uh, recently in this, culture um, and term HSC expansion culture conditions for mouse. This in part was through uh, finding that we could replace uh, serum albumin for this synthetic polymer called polyvinyl alcohol or PVA, which supported greater expansion and functional potential of, of expanded HSCs. So using polyvinyl alcohol or PVA in combination with these two cytokines, TPO or thrombopotin and SCF or stem cell factor, we can now grow HSCs long-term ex vivo, um, so specifically mouse. Um, in these cultures, we see large proliferation over one or two months, but a fairly stable immunophenotype. Importantly, limiting dilution assays performed at the day 28 time point suggest around one in 34 of our cells are still functional cells. And when we do plants in this, into secondary recipients, uh, we can also confirm that these are truly multipotent long-term functional HFDs that are expanded. So what are the applications for this in um, cell and gene therapy? So, uh, Last year, we were able to show that the large numbers of HSCs generated through this approach could be used to perform radiation-free chemotherapy HSCT. And we've also been recently applying these principles to other cell um, therapy products, such as developing a PVA-based CAR T-cell uh, expansion system. However, today I'd like to uh, present uh, on two other stories, which are more or less unpublished. First, on our efforts to use it to study HSCT gene therapies. And secondly, our efforts to develop the equivalent long-term human HSC expansion culture conditions. So as we've been hearing about already today, autologous HSCT gene therapies have been developed and are being developed for a range of um, serious congenital uh, diseases. And in very simple terms, um, involve collection of a patient's HSCs, their modification ex vivo, and the return of those HSCs to the patient with the aim of reconstituting a healthy hematopoietic system. The advent of CRISPR-Cas9 has led to a number of um, new approaches um, to edit human HSCs, um, but the majority of these have only um, so far been validated in human HSCs that are then transplanted into the xenograft um, uh, immunodeficient mice. And here I'd like to make the argument 
that autologous HSCT in a mouse-to-mouse -mouse setting provides a useful and complementary approach to evaluate human HSC gene editing, uh, and particularly within red blood cell and platelet studies, which um, human HSCs poorly reconstitute in these immunodeficient models. So here we've been collaborating with the Porteous Lab to um, evaluate their Cas9 AAV6 technology to perform targeted editing in mouse HSCs. First, we started off by just uh, evaluating whether we could perform a simple GFP knock-in into the ROSA26 locus using this AAV6 uh, correction set. Uh, in these mouse HSC cultures, we typically see 20 to 30 percent gene correction, as as viewed here by uh, GFP. And importantly, when these cultures are then transplanted into both primary and secondary recipients, we see long-term multilineage reconstitution. And here, I'd just like to highlight that uh, we not only see myeloid T cell and B cell um, reconstitution by these GFP targeted HSCs but also red blood cell and platelets, confirming we're really targeting long-term multipotent um, HSCs. So next, we were interested in whether we could apply this system to uh, investigate the uh, beta-globin correction methods developed by the Porteous Lab to um, correct sickle cell disease. As we heard earlier, sickle cell disease is caused by this um, point mutation in the beta-globin loci that causes this abnormal hemoglobin production and a range of red blood cell pathologies. And this, um, these gene correction uh, reagents help to um, uh, or, or, uh, repair this, this SNP mutation. So here we have um, leveraged a uh, nice mouse model of sickle cell disease developed by Tim Towns, um, which actually has the um, alpha and beta globins from the human genome knocked into the mouse genome which allows us to perform um, gene editing in mouse HSCs, but using the human uh, reagents. So similar to the ROSA26 locus editing, uh, we see 20 to 30% allelic correction of the human HBB in these mouse HSCs. And importantly, when we transplant these back into mice, we see these gene edited HSCs can produce um, corrected hemoglobin A in the peripheral blood. There is uh, unfortunately a bit of a range in, in the level of hemoglobin um, chimerism, um, but uh, we, we do see long-term stable chimerism. And uh, here I just wanted to highlight that this is a truly autologous setting. We take sickle cell HSCs from these mice, gene correct them, and then put them back into sickle cell towns mice, um, which only express the uh, hemoglobin S version. And these mice are all in, uh, transfusion independent after the first 10 days. Importantly, we see a strong selective advantage for gene correction in erythropoiesis. As you can see here, we see much higher levels of hemoglobin A or corrected um, red blood cells um, in the peripheral blood as compared to something like um, uh, HPB allelic correction within the myeloid lineage. However, we do believe that um, long-term myeloid Gene correction is um, a useful indicator of the success of the study as it uh, strongly inversely cor correlates with um, the frequency of these immature uh, red blood cells known as reticular sites within the peripheral blood of these mice. So having generated these um, autologous HSCT uh, recipients, we can now start to look at the uh, function of these red blood cells derived from these gene-corrected HSCs. Here we've performed a uh, in vivo red blood cell half-life assay in a cohort of three mice. Two mice had high levels of reconstitution and hemoglobin A levels, uh, and the third unfortunately did not. As you can see here, these um, gene-corrected uh, mice essentially have normalized um, red blood cell half-lives, um, while this third um, uh, has reverted to the pre-transplant sickle cell state, unfortunately. Additionally, within these uh, mice that have been successfully gene corrected, uh, we see a lack of the uh, abnormal red blood cell stick of this disease. So we're very excited about the uh, potential applications of this mouse gene editing 
uh, mouse HSC gene editing technology um, to investigate and hopefully optimize the various um, bottlenecks um, that currently exist in uh, this, this therapeutic paradigm. Of course, uh, a lot of the potential of this will depend on whether or not we can get the equivalent human HSC expansion conditions set up. So what are we missing um, at the moment in terms of human HSC expansion? What's very noticeable uh, when we compare mouse and human HSPCs in these PVA-based medias containing just SCF and TPO is that while mouse HSPCs grow rapidly, human HSCs or human HSPCs um, only divide once or twice during a week-long culture. By comparing these two cultures, we identified a lack of PI3 kinase and AKT phosphorylation within the human HSPCs, which we thought might be responsible for this um, weak proliferative activity. We therefore tested out whether uh, uh, small molecule agonists of these um, kinases might help to promote proliferative activity. And we identified a one uh, PI3 kinase activator called 740YP, which could significantly improve the proliferative activity of human HSPCs in these culture conditions. Cutting a rather longer story short, um, it turns out that this PI3 kinase activator can actually entirely replace the cytokine SCF in these cult conditions. And we've also been able to uh, replace the other cytokine, TPO, with uh, butazamide, another small molecule, uh, which is a TPO mimetic. And finally, we've combined these two small molecule agonists with UM171, which is a well-described HSC um, agonist. So using just these three small molecules in cytokine-free medias um, and with PVA, we can now support stable uh, expansion of HSPCs, human HSPCs, long-term over 30 days or more. However, the proliferation of these or expansion of these cell cultures is still low. We only see around 20-fold expansion over 30 days. We therefore start to think that although PVA is great for mouse HSC expansion, perhaps it's not optimal for human HSC expansion. We therefore uh, performed some polymer screening uh, from which we identified Soluplus as a, a new polymer which was able to support much more rapid proliferation of um, human HSPCs as compared to PVA. This is also seen in these longer term um, ex vivo cultures, where we can now get up to 60, 70 fold expansion of HSPCs over 30 days. Importantly, when we transplant these cell cultures into immunodeficient mice, we see uh, robust chimerism within peripheral blood, bone marrow and spleen. And here I just wanted to highlight that these transplants are, are done using just 10 to the four cultured cells from these day 30 cultures, suggesting we have um, fairly significant expansion during um, this ex vivo culture time. So in conclusion, I hope that I've convinced you that long-term ex vivo expansion of functional mouse and human HSCs is possible, and it can be achieved through optimizing self-renewal signaling, limiting differentiation inducing uh, stimuli, and through the use of um, synthetic polymers such as PVA or Soluplus. Um, I've also shown you that we've been able to apply cas 9 v 6 technology to the mouse expansion culture system to um, confirm that we can gene edit functionally multipotent long-term HSCs. And we're very excited about the potential opportunities of this new expansion technology um, in the development of the next generation of cell and gene therapies. So with that, I'd just like to finish by acknowledging everyone involved in these studies, uh, in particular here in Akuchi, his lab here at Stanford, in particular those uh, people named here, um, as well as his lab in Tokyo, and there um, uh, Satoshi Yamazaki, who's actually now independent at Scuba, um, with his postdoc, Masatoshi, um, have been really leading the human HS expansion conditions I just presented. And then, of course, uh, I want to thank all our great uh, collaborators here at Stanford, in particular Matt Portis and Danny Dever, as well as the uh, funding agencies who've been kind enough to support this research. 
So thank you, and I hope to take questions. Thank you. That was a really great talk. Um, we do have a question. Um, can you explain more how long-term expansion obviates the need for conditioning in the mice? Wouldn't you still need to empty the niche? So um, we, we aren't the first uh, group to show that if you transplant large numbers of stem cells, you can get engraftment in um, non-conditioned recipient mice. Um, however, um, usually these studies required 50 or more uh, donor mice to one recipient. And so the ability to expand this large numbers of cells um, uh, means it's much more feasible. Um, <clears throat> uh, in terms of getting engraftment, it's thought that there are um, small numbers of, of niches available in the non-conditioned bone marrow that allow for engraftment, um, and, but it, it's not a very efficient process, which is why we need so many um, stem cells to get robust engraftment. So in that case then, when you bring this into, into patients, do you envision not needing to condition in that setting or do you imagine there will still be some conditioning involved? I know one of your slides mentioned, um, you know, uh, an, uh, I think it's an antibody-based um, uh, non-toxic conditioning. Uh, I was just wondering if you could speak more to that. Yes, um, so I think it depends on uh, the uh, type of disease. Um, we have also been evaluating whether um, expanded HSCs help in these antibody-based conditioning and um, preliminary data suggest we can also boost um, engraftment levels significantly if we combine them with these antibody-based approaches. Um, if that answers your question. Yeah. Excellent. Um, okay. Uh, can you discuss the potential uses for CAR T cell manufacturing? So one of the, um, the reasons we, we started looking at this was because um, most CAR T cells are still produced uh, using, um, or the, the cultures require human, human serum. And um, this is ex expensive, it's batch variable, and um, potentially has, has con contaminants which could be, could be dangerous. And so we were hoping to be able to develop a fully chemically defined cold condition um, for the CAR T cell um, process. Uh, so this is just a sort of first proof of concept and we're, we're hoping to, to build on this to, to f further enhance the, um, uh, the production of, of those, those cells. Excellent. All right. Well, I think um, that's all the questions we have. Um, so I will now hand it over to Dr. Gomez Espina, who will introduce our next speaker. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Chrissy Redhorse. She's an associate professor uh, of biology at Stanford. Um, she's one of the few people in the world studying cardiovascular development, specifically development of the coronary arteries. And I think she's going to tell us about coronary arteries and condylar heart disease defects. Thank you, Natalia and Melissa. Um, yes, today I am going to talk about coronary vessels and what we've learned about how uh, it interacts during development with the heart wall and uh, defects of which can cause uh, congenital heart uh, diseases in uh, mouse models. And so um, I'm a PhD and my lab is uh, primarily a developmental biology and regenerative biology uh, laboratory. So we study a lot of uh, cell biology of the vascular system. And the vascular system that we focus on is uh, that of the heart. So the coronary vessels, of course, are the blood vessels that uh, course through the ventricular heart muscle. And this is showing uh, the clinical importance of this particular vascular bed. The coronary uh, arteries are those that uh, are most commonly diseased uh, in a heart disease, which is of course the leading cause of death. And so we study how these uh, coronary arteries develop during embryogenesis and how they respond uh, to injury. And so what happens during development is there is initially the formation of this uh, heart tube that is beating, but it's not large enough, the muscular layer of it to need a vasculature yet. Uh, but at some point it will grow in size and trigger the mechanisms that create this uh, really beautifully patterned vascular bed. 
And we study our, and are in, at least interested in all aspects of how this transition happens. And over uh, the past uh, eight years, we've done a lot of work in this area using mouse as a model system. And more recently, we've taken the lessons that we've learned during development and reinstated those in the injured heart to induce uh, regeneration of coronary arteries uh, to uh, benefit models of mouse uh, cardiac injury. But today I'm gonna to talk about uh, one part of the lab where, uh, as I mentioned, we had a discovery that we think is uh, important to add to the field of uh, congenital heart defects. And that discovery uh, involves the growth of the muscular wall of uh, the heart during development. And so this is uh, just an old picture of the, the heart. Uh, and the point that I wanna make with this slide is that there is a very important patterning and uh, thickness to the heart, the mammalian heart wall that is required for uh, this organ to be able to successfully pump blood uh, through the entire or, uh, organism through in its entire life. And so the patterning and development of this is very important. And we discovered a role of coronary vessels that was a little bit of an unexpected role in um, supporting the growth of this wall. And it was a little bit serendipitous in that uh, we didn't initially expect that to have the findings that I'll tell you about today. Um, but how this happened was when I started my lab, I was next door <clears throat> to Ashby Morrison who studied in yeast this chromatin remodeling complex, the INO80 complex. And so uh, she studied this mainly in single celled organisms, but uh, we got together and wondered whether uh, this would have a role, this chromatin remodeling complex would have a role in development, which had not been tested before. And so since our lab's expertise was the cardiovascular system, um, we knocked out INO80 and the many different cell types in the heart uh, and I'll tell you about what happened in a few slides. But first I'll tell you that the I-know-80 complex, uh, of course, is involved in uh, regulating uh, gene expression because it changes the structure of the chromatin. And in many studies, it's been shown to maintain accessible chromatin at specific sites. For example, uh, uh, in pluripotency genes uh, during uh, stem, in stem cell cultures, as well as uh, in tumor models. And so whenever we got together and uh, knocked out this gene in the, in the mouse to look at the phenotype, uh, this was done by a student that we shared, Jay Chung, and a uh, postdoc, Xi'an Ri, in my lab. And we were joined later on by David Paik from Joseph Liu's lab. So again, it's important to have this patterning and thickness of the heart wall. And we can see that in mouse models if we look histologically. This is a heart embryonic day E15.5. And I wanna point out here that there's this very thick layer, which we call the compact myocardium that develops at this thickness uh, in gestation. Uh, but there's also these more loosely packed layers. This is called the trabecular myocardium and it's finger-like projections that uh, stick out into the lumen of the heart. And so when we knocked out INO80 from different cell types within the heart, we found a phenotype when we knocked it out from the endothelial cells uh, primarily. And that phenotype was quite striking. It was uh, that the entire heart wall remained very loosely packed as if it was almost uh, completely made up of a trabecular myocardium. And so we wanted to know what the events during earlier heart development that led to this phenotype were. And let me tell you a little bit about how the heart develops so that uh, I can tell you how we understood which process was uh, going awry. So first in that stage that I talked about earlier where there's just a heart tube, there's a single cell layer of cardiomyocytes, which are the muscle cells and uh, of endocardium, which is the endothelial lining of the heart. And what happens over time during early development is that there'll be the uh, outgrowths of these trabeculae that form this trabeculated myocardium. And of course, this is called trabeculation. And this is uh, requiring signals from this endocardium layer to the myocardium, secretion of NERG1 and notch signaling, for example. 
There's a second stage that allows us to get the, the final structure of the heart, and that's called compaction. And that's where we have the trabeculated myocardium transforming into a thicker layer. And that is by proliferation of the cardiomyocytes that have a, a compact layer identity, as well as the coalescence of these trabecul uh, trabeculae. Uh, and then the final result is a compacted heart wall. And so in order to see whether trabeculation or compact uh, growth compaction was affected, we looked at different time points. And here I'm showing you E12.5 to make the point that this earlier stage uh, was not affected. So in both our knockout and our control, we have at early stages, the initiation of this compact layer and very uh, normal trabeculation, which we also saw transcriptionally and um, at the protein level, uh, very similar between the, the two genotypes. But it's just this phenotype of uh, the trabeculated uh, chamber that we saw at later stages. So then we came to the conclusion because of that, that it wasn't trabeculation that was a problem in these mutants, it was compaction. And so our next question was, uh, was it this proliferation that was uh, defective or this coalescence? This coalescence is very difficult to test currently experimentally, uh, or it was when we started these studies, but proliferation is uh, quite simple to look at. Uh, we, uh, one of the ways that we looked at that was to inject the mice with EDU. And we found that in the, uh, in the compact layer of myocardium, those cardiomyocytes have uh, a decreased proliferation. So there's a, uh, the phenotype of uh, these mice has to do at least in part with it, an inability to undergo compaction because these compact myocardium uh, cells cannot, are not proliferating properly. And so at this point, we were quite interested in this phenotype because it was reminiscent of this uh, human cardiomyopathy, left ventricular non-compaction or LVNC. This is the third most common cardiomyopathy its underlying cause is poorly understood and probably because it's uh, pleiotropic. Uh, the diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment are not clearly defined. Uh, for this audience, I'll note that it commonly infects children. It's reported to account for 9.2% of pediatric cardiomyopathies. Uh, and it can be uh, asymptomatic or all the way ranging um, from fatal. Uh, and usually this is because of insufficient uh, systemic blood flow, uh, embolisms and arrhythmias. And so here's just a picture uh, depicting that where we have these, uh, these trabeculations that are uh, remaining after uh, development. And here we can see the real picture of these uh, persisting trabeculations. And so uh, the pathology manifests in cardiomyocytes and so the clinical perception of this disease has uh, for a long time been that it's the disease of the muscle. And so uh, uh, supporting that is the fact that uh, human genetics has shown that variants that are uh, statistically associated with LVNC uh, have been found in mus muscle function genes, a few of, of which I've listed here. However, there have been other variants that are reported to be uh, associated with LVNC. And these are in other cells, such as endothelial cells and fibroblasts, uh, of which I've listed here. And then when we've done some single cell RNA sequencing analysis of the mouse embryonic and human embryonic heart, and we've seen that, yes, indeed, these genes that are associated with LVNC are expressed in cardiomyocytes a lot, but also in these other cell types, um, including endothelial cells and fibroblasts and smooth muscle cells. And so all of these mutations that are variants that I am describing, many of them make sense, um, but not all of them, and actually very few of them have been functionally tested. Those that have been functionally tested belong to this, um, most of them belong to the endothelial expressed uh, um, uh, category. And so for example, Jose Luis de la Pampa has shown that mutations uh, found in LVNC patients are in the notch pathway, and when they, he deletes those from the endothelial compartment, uh, then there's LVNC in, in mice. So the question for us in our model of LVNC was, does the pathology arise from the endocardium or the coronary endothelium? Because we had deleted uh, them with a driver, we deleted the I know AD gene 
with a driver that's expressed in both of these cell types. And so it was important to know if this communication between these was, it, was detrimental or was it the communication between these two cell types? And we did a lot of analysis and I'll just show you what we found. We uh, found that the, uh, the endocardium seemed to be uh, quite normal, whereas coronary vessel angiogenesis was highly defective. And that's shown here with a picture of an embryonic heart stained for endothelial cells. And you can see here this nice plexus. This is an immature vascular plexus that looks very typical of what we're used to. However, this looks very different and this is a malformed vascular plexus. And this and other data uh, indicated to us that it wasn't the endocardium, but uh, mostly the coronary endothelium uh, that was uh, defective here, defective in its uh, angiogenesis or growth onto the heart. And so um, we wanted to ask the question then, could you just generally inhibit coronary development and would you get the same phenotype, LV and C? And so we used some mouse genetic tricks and showed that indeed this is. If we didn't uh, do any genetic changes in the endocardium, but we just inhibited the development of coronary vessels specifically, then we got this LV and C phenotype shown by comparing these two. So we think that the lack of uh, coronary endothelium is important for the generation of this phenotype. And of course we wanted to know mechanistically why. And uh, everybody in the audience would, might think, uh, of course it's because you're lacking oxygen and nutrients because if you don't uh, have these components, you can't grow a tissue. Um, but in the field of vascular biology, we're also noticing that endothelial cells have more uh, of a role than just to bring oxygen to tissues. And uh, this has been termed angiocrine functions because they secrete supportive growth factors and other types of factors to their adjacent tissue. And so we wanted to look at whether that could be possible. And to do that, we did an experiment by taking oxygen out of uh, the, the equation. And so to do this, we cultured our uh, embryonic ventricles so that then the uh, endocardial vessel, the endocardium will sprout out forming the coronary vessels in a dish. And then of course in this, the oxygen is a normal air oxygen. We don't have uh, that as a variable and uh, the media is completely rich in every condition. And so when we use this model, we see coronary vessels sprouting out as shown uh, with the blue staining here. And here we can see that uh, not only does that happen, but the cardiomyocytes stained here uh, expand in their layer. If we do the same experiment with INO80 uh, hearts that I showed you earlier, then we have a decrease in sprouting and the decrease of this expansion of the cardiomyocytes. And if we non-specifically delete coronary angiogenesis from these cultures, uh, then we get the same effect. And this is also borne out from an analyzing um, proliferation of cardiomyocytes. So we thought this was evidence that uh, endothelial cells of blood vessels support, and coronary blood vessels specifically support myocardial growth independent of oxygen and nutrient transport. And so then we wanted to look into uh, a pair, possible paracrine factor, and we use single cell RNA sequencing to look at uh, secreted genes that uh, encode secreted factors that are specifically expressed in coronary endothelial cells and down in the INO80 mutants. And one of those we found to be collagen 15A1, which we validated by in situ hybridization. And so to functionally test whether collagen 15A1 might stimulate cardiomyocyte proliferation, we added it to our cultures and it did. Uh, we rescued this cultured, uh, uh, this, this culture uh, experiment where we had a lack of uh, proliferation in the cardiomyocytes when we added from, when we took hearts from the mutants. And if we just depleted the endothelial cells, we got the same decrease in proliferation, which we again uh, rescued with adding collagen 15A1. And then also when we added uh, the collagen 15A1 to a iPSC derived cardiomyocyte line derived from patients with LVNC, we were able to rescue the uh, decrease in proliferation uh, from these animals. And so from this data, we concluded that 
our phenotype was a lack of collagen 15A1 and that coronary vessels secrete this to support proliferation. Um, but we also looked at the differentially expressed genes in the other cell compartments and we found a really interesting thing. And that was that not only were things lacking from coronary vessels, but endocardium also had uh, the overexpression as shown in all these purple bars compared to the orange control, they had the overexpression of a bunch of secreted factors. And when we added those to the cardiomyocyte cultures, um, both in our mouse ventricle cultures and in iPS cells, these factors made by the endocardium uh, sec uh, suppress proliferation. And so not only do we think the pathology of LVNC in our um, model is a lack of supported factors, but also the uh, induction of inhibitory factors from the endocard diseased endocardium. Uh, interestingly, when we added those factors to iPSC-derived cardiomyocytes, we could increase, we noticed that they increased their uh, maturation as shown by these, the staining of the sarcomere morphology, as well as doing physiology on the cells. And this was pretty exciting because uh, so we also saw this in vivo. And this was pretty exciting because uh, we know that one of the problems with cultured iPSC-derived cardiomyocytes is that uh, they don't mature enough in culture. And so if we could use our model to discover some uh, secreted factors that we could add and uh, induce their maturation, uh, which we have shown that they have done, then that uh, is very uh, exciting to the stem cell field. Okay, so finally, I'll summarize the I know 80 deletion causes a mouse model of LVNC. Uh, coronary endothelial cells, and the reason they have LVNC is because the, they don't have enough coronary endothelial cells, and the ones they have do not secrete this, um, this protein that supports myocardial growth. I know 80 deficient endocardial cells contribute to the phenotype uh, by affecting um, cardiomyocyte proliferation and maturation. And this led, uh, this somewhat surprising result led to the identification of factors that we could use to uh, mature iPSC derived uh, cardiomyocytes. And now our, this study is part of a, a growing body of literature that's uh, allowing us to reconsider the, the underlying uh, cause for LVNC. And so finally, I have, uh, to thank Xi'an Ri, who uh, did spearheaded and um, performed most of the work that I showed today, uh, as well as uh, Joe Wu and David Pack and my funding. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. Um, let's see, we, we have a couple of questions. Um, is the development of compacted myocardial cells affected by preterm pre -term birth as early as 22, 24 weeks gestation? Um, so heart development uh, in humans is a lot different uh, than in mice. It, the heart develops fully much earlier in humans. Um, and so the compact layer and the, the size uh, of the heart gets, there's a lot more maturation phase. Uh, um, so I don't know if there are, and I haven't come across any uh, correlations with LVNC and preterm labor, but um, in, in mice, uh, we don't really uh, have uh, any data on that. Um, um, here's another question. So can you discuss the maturation timing of endo endocardial derived secreted factors? It seems too much could be bad. Right. So um, the problem in our, our mouse model is that there are too many of them. And so during the early phases of heart development, these uh, factors, some of these factors are high, but then they get shut off later on so that you can switch uh, from the trabeculation phase to the compact growth phase. Um, but then some of them um, that I described in that collection, they get induced by hypoxia. So it's a feedback loop that is detrimental to heart, uh, heart development. Uh, so if you're not getting angiogenesis of the coronary vessels, you're having hypoxia, increased hypoxia than expected in the tissue, then those endocardial cells sense it, they start upregulating these factors that then inhibit the surrounding cardiomyocytes from uh, growing. And so it's a, a detrimental feedback loop. Great. Um, I think we have time for more questions. I don't see any more on Slido, but um, 
I can ask a question. I've always maybe wrongly thought of left ventricle non-compaction as something that could be kind of acquired. Um, can you think of a, you know, could this be something that, you know, it's a, a, an abnormal remodeling process in the heart in response to, you know, exercise or something, et cetera? Right. So the, the pathology is the, uh, these large invaginations of the, the endocardium into uh, the, the myocardial layer. Uh, and so those would have to persist uh, from development. Mm -hmm. And usually if something happens uh, later on, uh, it's more uh, like a thin myocardial wall uh, with a, a dilated cardiomyopathy, for example. Right. That's what we see also in mouse models. If we do the intervention later, we don't get the persistent trabeculae, but we get a thin myocardium. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you everyone. Thank you all the speakers. Um, oh wait, there's one more question. So what do you think accounts for the reversal of the compaction from E12.5 to E15.5? Um, the reversal of compaction, you mean in our mutants? Um, uh, so normally the compaction is initiated under normal situations between 12.5 and 15.5 and um, later on uh, even postnatally. Um, and so what we think accounts for that is, uh, we, 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 we think part of it obviously is uh, the, in, infiltration of coronary vessels secreting these growth factors for cardiomyocytes. Um, and so there's also some, probably some mechanical factors as well. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, thank you um, everyone. We want to thank Dr. Williams, our keynote speaker, Dr. Wilkinson and Dr. Red Horse for amazing presentations. Um, our next session is a virtual poster session, which I encourage you all to attend. Um, um, the presentations are very exciting.